The next session uh, that we're getting into uh, is about reinventing the delivery in the healthcare uh, ecosystem. We got a we got a very we got a stellar panel uh, with four speakers. I would like to invite uh, the moderator of this panel, Mr. Vikram Vukula, the founder and CEO of Nephroplus. Vikram uh, Bill, Vikram brings on board uh, a, a great experience of over 12 years in strategizing and advising uh, hospitals, uh, delivery centers, etc. on growth and business aspects of running the healthcare business. He's an alum, alumnus of IIT Kharagpur and the Chicago School Business School. Vikram, I would request you to please take over and invite the other panelists also. Thank you. Patra from Matrix Partners. Uh, Dr. Ajay Madam from uh, <coughs> Jivanti Hospitals, Mr. Kaushik Sain from Lifespring Healthcare as well, to the dais please. Please okay. welcome to the delegates of this session. Uh, this particular session is very close to my heart. It's about reinventing the healthcare delivery, the paradigm of healthcare delivery in India. Uh, the way we want to run this panel is, <coughs> I found it most effective from the some of the other panels we have run is each, speak, each panelist take three to four minutes to introduce themselves and their company and we want this to be more uh, Q&A driven panel. Uh, so we would love to hear your questions and make sure you get the answers for your questions. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kaushik Sain to talk about himself, his venture and how uh, Lifespring is redefining the healthcare delivery in India. This is working. I am Kaushik Sen. Uh, I started and run a company called uh, HealthSpring Community Medical Centers. Uh, we are essentially focused on creating organized primary care. Uh, essentially trying to bring uh, family medicine back in, uh, in, in sort of a modern setting. And so we run a, we run a network of uh, medical centers uh, which are staffed by, uh, by full-time physicians uh, and also have essentially all of the routine services under one roof. And we create a network for our uh, for our patients by connecting to hospitals and specialists, and also running around the clock uh, emergency system uh, in the city of Bombay. Uh, I started this journey about uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, prior to that, I was a consultant for many years uh, at uh, at Pain and Company, where I did mostly healthcare consulting. And of course, prior to that, I did my uh, MBA at Harvard, and I did my undergrad in the US as well. So that's a quick two minutes of my side. Thank you. Uh, Surprisingly, well, um, I noted when we met before this session that uh, all of us uh, seem to have come into healthcare from outside the, uh, the healthcare sector, and I'm no different. I used to be a banker. I spent 28 years with Standard Chartered Bank. Um, so, right in the middle of the last decade, I uh, was persuaded to invest in a franchise of the Apollo Clinic, which had a, a chain of clinics rather similar to yours, uh, Kaushik. Um, and uh, we ran that from about 2006-07 in uh, 2006 in Thane. And um, about uh, the beginning of last year, I started Jivanti Healthcare, essentially with the intent of um, starting a chain of. 50 bed secondary care hospitals in small towns uh, in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Uh, and small towns which are currently underserved in terms of hospitals and healthcare. Um, the, the rationale for it was quite simple. Um, I had been um, aware of other such initiatives, one in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh uh, called Vatsalya, and another one in uh, Madhya Pradesh, sorry, in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, called GV Meditech. And so I had already been thinking about it and uh, made a trip to a small town outside Mumbai called Ambarna, um, which is about 60 kilometers uh, from Mantralaya, South Bombay. And I met a doctor there who told me that uh, although there were a good number of doctors in the town, there was no critical care available. So if there was a, a citizen of that town who needed critical care, he had to be transported uh, in a rather rickety ambulance over very bad roads to Thane or Bulund, where proper hospitals were available. And often those patients did not survive the journey. And I found that quite horrifying. Uh, 
that this is not what one expected so close to India's commercial capital. Uh, so I felt I had to do something about it and so building on what I knew of these other ventures, I decided that I would start something similar. Essentially our chain would focus on four specialties, gynecology, pediatrics, general medicine and general surgery. Um, our model is a brownfield model and by that I mean we don't buy land and build a hospital, we take over existing hospitals. Uh, essentially, um, we would be able to provide an exit for a doctor, for example, uh, who's uh, nearing retirement age and has no one to pass the hospital on to. Um, in fact, uh, the second hospital fits that description entirely. The doctor is 66 years old, he's been working 16 to 18, years, uh, 18 hours a day for the last 30 years. And he was delighted when we approached him uh, that he could hand over the hospital to us to run. He would still continue to practice. Uh, he's a general surgeon, he'd continue to run his OPDs and his surgeries, but he could work a more decent eight or nine hours a day rather than uh, 16 to 18 hours a day. So that means we have a win-win solution uh, for both of us. And um, having taken over that hospital, which was um, a general uh, surgery, and a gynecology practice. Uh, the doctor's wife herself was a gynecologist. We have now added pediatrics and we are in the process of adding a general physician. Um, and therefore we'd now be able to offer critical care services as well. So that's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, pricing wise we have uh, no intention in the short term to raise prices, we'll continue to operate at the same sort of level. Our intent is that we would um, uh, achieve break even for the additional investments we make through um, volume and scale. So the hospital which was about 20, 30 beds would be built up to 50 beds. Um, we um, currently have funding for two more hospitals and they're in advanced stages of negotiation so we should have four in the next six months and we're also uh, raising funds for 10 more. And that's what, what I have. Thanks, sir. Uh, like to request Asish to, to you know really define the healthcare uh, space. But my job is to actually help people who kind of uh, have that mission. So a bit about myself. I I'm a healthcare industry professional more than uh, being an investor. So did uh, healthcare work for about five six years uh, with McKinsey, and then uh, joined Matrix. So I lead the healthcare practice there. Here uh, we've made uh, investments in the healthcare services domain predominantly. Uh, investments include uh, something in eye care, which is called Center for Sight, uh, something in uh, maternity and infant uh, maternity and infant care chain, more neonatal, called Cloud9, uh, something in orthopedics called Mewar Orthopedic, which is actually a tier two based trauma focused orthopedic chain based out of Rajasthan, Gujarat, and MP. And the fourth one is a cosmetology chain called Enhance. Uh, so yeah, look forward to your questions and. Uh, we'll try to answer. Excellent. Thanks, Ashish. I founded this company, Nephroplus Kidney Care Centers, about three years back. Prior to that, uh, I was after studying at IIT. I spent about ten years in the U.S., including stints at Abbott Laboratories and getting an MBA from University of Chicago Booth, and then worked at McKinsey for a few years, like Ashish, and quit everything to come back to India three years back to start this company along with a dialysis patient called Kamal Shah and an ISB alumnus called Sandeep. So three of us, we conceptualized Nephroplus. We raised uh, angel round about one crore. We got off the first center and then very quickly in six months, we raised another couple of crores with the same angel investors. And uh, fortunately, last November, we got funded by Bessemer Venture Partners, a uh, leading venture capital firm. And now we operate 10 kidney care centers and four uh, more are in the build out phase. Now, uh, that just gives you a background of the panelists. Before getting into the Q&A, uh, there's one question I would like to ask the uh, fellow panelists, which is maybe starting with Kaushik. Uh, compared to the previous generations focus on large multi-specialty hospitals, how is HealthSpring or how is each one of our companies trying to redefine healthcare and what are the things that you see uh, what are the couple of critical factors 
that are ha the change factors that are happening in the industry, which will help uh, companies like Healthsprint uh, take it to the next level. Uh, if I take a step back and I think about broadly the healthcare market, um, and just in terms of service delivery, you know, the, the I guess the commonly understood breakup of the market is that uh, about 55-60% uh, of the market in terms of revenues uh, comes from primary care. So you think of primary care essentially your GPs or your first level of uh, first level of care entry into the into the healthcare system. Uh, another about 20% comes from uh, secondary care, which is specialists and and, uh, and diagnostics. And the remainder comes from tertiary care, which is the hospitals. So hospitals typically are a little bit bigger than, uh, than other countries, but let's say about 30% of the market. So that's the space that has really seen a lot of focus, a lot of investment, a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of innovation over the last 10-15 years. Uh, but the space that we're in, uh, which is a primary care space, has really seen very little of all of those, uh, all of those things. It's still hugely fragmented. Uh, care is now given by uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of local GPs. Uh, standards are very poor. There's really, you know, you can practice uh, allopathic uh, family medicine even if you're trained in Ayurvedic or homeopath. Um, and uh, ethics are pretty poor. There's a lot of uh, very entrenched kind of referral systems and, uh, and referral payments that, that happen. Uh, and in general, the, the quality of care as well as the quality of service delivery is, is quite poor. Um, so when we when we set out to think about what part of the healthcare market we should play in, and, and actually I, you know, my personal background is more in the in the hospital space, that's the space that I understood. Uh, but taking a step back and thinking about the overall market, I, I really felt very convinced that unless things are fixed at the entry point of healthcare, uh, no matter how much we invest and how much we upgrade our, our tertiary care level, uh, we're really not going to see the kind of health outcomes and the kind of cost benefits uh, that we should start seeing. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that you see insurance in India, for example, is, um, actually as a pretty un, uh, unprofitable business. It's, it's essentially because there is no uh, control over the escalation from primary to secondary to tertiary. Meaning the rate of admissions to hospitals is, is quite high in our country. And so we felt that unless you can bring in standards here, uh, you can't really impact uh, healthcare in a big way. Uh, but if you can bring in standards at the primary care level, uh, you create something really powerful because you're controlling the entry point of healthcare, you're diagnosing things, you're getting them right the first time, um, you are not over-referring, you're not under-referring, uh, so if doctors are trained in the proper protocols, the proper care pathways, uh, you actually can, um, can take a lot of the art out of it and, and really bring it down to a science and make sure that, that things are caught properly and things are caught well. Uh, so that's the reason we're focused on, on primary care, that's the reason we're excited about it. Uh, we really think that it can uh, bring about a lot of uh, better outcomes and, uh, and better cost outcomes as well uh, throughout the chain. So that's sort of the path that we're focused on. I would say in terms of enablers, there's really two enablers if I, if I think about it for, for my business to come up. Uh, the first business, the first enabler is you know, the, uh, I guess the supply of good family doctors uh, is something which is stagnate, stagnating to declining in, uh, in India in general. The fewer and fewer new medical graduates go into family medicine or, or GPs, they want to go to specialization, they want to specialize further and further. Um, and that whole generation of people who came out to be family doctors, that generation is in general a declining generation. So even if you have a family doctor here, um, you tend to, uh, that, that person tends to practice only for a few hours or to practice in a location which is now not very convenient for you because you've moved from one part of the city to another. Uh, so that's one broad, uh, one broad macro theme, I would say, which, which enables our, our business. Uh, the second broad macro theme, I think, is that consumers are looking for choices. Um, uh, one of the things that we've seen across multiple sectors in India is this move from uh, unorganized to organized, meaning that you are now looking for standards, whether it be in the, in the grocery store that you go to uh, to buy some things, whether the products that you buy, uh, whether you, you know, go to a hospital, uh, it used to be, you know, 15 years ago, the only hospitals that were running were the, were the doctor-led or the trust-led hospitals. And now you're seeing so many chains come up and, and, and bringing standards in. And so I think those are the two uh, factors that, that enable our business as well. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Maybe, I don't know. 80% um, of the doctors live and work in the urban centers. Um, and our population is the opposite way. So, um, People therefore have to travel long distances to get hospital, 
hospital care. And our research has established that the cost of hospital care actually trebles when one has to travel outside your hometown to get the care. Because uh, the patient obviously doesn't travel alone. At least three or four people on average accompany the patient to the hospital in another town, which means the cost of transport, the cost of stay, the cost of food, and possibly also the cost of uh, lost wages. So that uh, uh, works out about three times what the hospital bill itself would, would be. So we're quite convinced that providing good quality care in the location where it's required would actually be attractive because people would be willing to pay for it. It's not that it's more expensive than they can afford. Uh, in fact, it would be significantly cheaper. Um, we also, um, um, as part of our market research when we started up Jivanti, we used a market research agency, Wispy Doctor, uh, sitting there. Uh, he runs a company called Ormax and they did some research for us. And we discovered that um, there is a general distrust of the healthcare industry. The patient believes that he's not really going to get a good deal when he goes into hospital. Uh, so we espouse, therefore, a, a, a motto that we would be simple, fair and transparent. And that transparency would mean that a patient would know how much his bill would be when he goes in and not be surprised with a bill about five times as high when he comes out. So um, to achieve some of these outcomes, we've had to uh, introduce uh, standard operating processes, um, standardized computer systems. Uh, we have to persuade doctors that we will decide the pricing not the individual doctor in every individual situation. Uh, because often that's what they're used to. You know, they look at the patient, they look at his capacity to pay, they're very good at that I believe, and then they decide how much the bill should be. So that's something that we've had to change. And it's not easy. Um, you know, Making that kind of change and retaining the doctors is quite a challenge. Um, and and uh, so we're in the throes of uh, doing some of those things. But um, Really, to be able to uh, achieve the level of transparency that people would value, we believe would eventually mean that uh, they would trust us, they would trust our brand, and they would uh, come to us when there is a need. One of the other things we're doing in addition to that, uh, again, something that came out of some uh, research we did, uh, we find that doctors do not spend as much time with their patients as they're required to in terms of explaining what is the problem, what is the prognosis, uh, what is the treatment seeking to achieve and so on. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, the patient and the patient's relatives often get quite frustrated. So uh, we decided that this is not something we could change by changing the behavior of the doctors. So we decided to insert a layer between the doctor and the patient, uh, which we call the Jivanti Mitra. And, and, uh, this person, he or she, would actually explain, do the explanation that the doctor doesn't feel has the time to do. Um, and uh, another version of the Jivanti Mitra also works in what we call our community outreach program, where we have a team of volunteers uh, from the community to actually go out and, uh, and um, reach out to the community to educate them on healthcare issues. So this may seem counterproductive, we're actually educating people how not to fall ill. So the amount of business we get will probably reduce. But we feel that in the long run, that actually serves uh, us as much as uh, any other approach. So these are some of the changes we're trying to make uh, in the way we approach the market. Excellent. Thanks, Arun. So just to give uh, three A's. One is the awareness, awareness of the, uh, the patients, especially when you look at kidney care, which is where we are focused. Uh, compared to five years ago, uh, the, the patients are extremely well aware and even the, the patient attendants who are the sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, they are very well aware. So once you are well aware, that means there is a chance to offer a quality value proposition, right? That's one. Second thing is the access. As Arun mentioned, uh, it, just by having a large super specialty hospital in each of the city would not be enough, especially in terms of dialysis. It's a chronic condition, you need to go there weekly thrice, three times a week for the patient and the attendant and so on. So access is a big issue that we are trying to uh, solve wherein 
uh, our vision is to have a dialysis center for every 4 kilometer traveling distance, right? So that these patients do not travel uh, much farther distances uh, to get quality dialysis care. The third uh, enabler critical factor that's happening is affordability. It's a combination of larger middle class, combination of private insurance, combination of government trying to reimburse for some kinds of care. So there, there are various factors that are increasing the affordability wherein the patients can now access quality health care without breaking their, uh, breaking their houses, right? So these are the three factors I would say where we are in the midst of this big change that is happening. I think in the 1980s, the corporate healthcare uh, got introduced and it revolutionized the way the uh, corporate healthcare is happening. In the next one decade, you will see a huge change of single specialty and niche healthcare, niche uh, 50 bedded hospitals trying to make a mark. There is a huge change happening. Of course, there are many experiments happening. Many will fail, but few of them will succeed and redefine the healthcare in India. I would like to ask uh, Ashish, from an investor perspective, how do you see the healthcare industry changing and what are some of the factors that you consider before you uh, make an investment decision in this space? So, uh, so I'll tell you the way we designed it such it's, uh, you know, it is at such an infancy or nascency in the country that first of all services is going to be much more lucrative than products whether it is pharmaceuticals, whether it is APIs, devices, so we actually prioritize services and a lot of the investors do for that matter. Within services, uh, there are obviously therapeutic services and diagnostic services. Within that, diagnostic is a little played out for us in the country like, because a lot of the diagnostic chains, whether they are path labs or imaging labs have gotten funded. It's essentially the therapeutic chain. Then, then how do you look at the therapeutic uh, services especially? So I actually agree with what uh, Vikram said and uh, Arun actually quoted before that, that fundamentally what is going to happen is that the private sector is going to drive innovation in business model. Because though even, even though the government spending is increasing, for it to actually percolate down to the healthcare infrastructure going up is still a long way away. We are still out of pocket, private sector driven market. So in the private sector, the way I personally split it is to say healthcare services can be of three types in a continuous spectrum starting from say cosmetic care, going to quality of life, going to you know life threatening. My personal focus is actually to look at quality of life hampering uh, single specialties wherein the person is not going to die but it's definitely going to uh, impact his quality of life. Could be his looks, could be eyesight, could be whatever. right? So hence, my ability as a company to actually build a brand independent of the doctor because there is no threat of mortality is actually the highest. And hence, I think business model innovations will actually happen in this middle space wherein the dependence on the doctor is relatively lower than what you would see in a tertiary care setup and the ability to scale and build a brand and to actually focus on customer experience is actually the highest. So you know some of this and hence I believe that this is the one that's going to pick up. Some of the specialties that will come up here are actually nephro, uh, ophthal, I think cosmetology, urology, uh, OBGYN, you know you can have deaths here as well but relatively the mortality rates are low. So that's how I look at uh, uh, investments in it. Thanks Ashish. I think in the spirit of making it uh, very interactive, what we would really like is for the uh, attendees to ask questions. Feel free to ask any question and uh, if possible, direct it to a specific panelist. Introduce yourself and uh, we would love to hear from you and we can try to answer as many questions as uh, we can. Uh, my name is Bharat Kera. I represent uh, My question is, I've heard a lot of talks about healthcare but very few mentions about mental health. Could you throw some light? Mental health. Uh, could you throw some light on what's happening in the health sector? See, mental health is of two for trauma incident, or could be because of any uh, you know long term instrument or neurology when there's something wrong with you know, the chemical loja like the mona right? So I think on the services side, I'll first throw some light on the services side. Fundamentally, it is very difficult to actually create a neurology institute or a psychiatric institute for that matter. 
Why? Because the investments that grow, that go into making a neurological institute are very, very high. Why are the investments very high? You need a CT scanner, you need a MRI. Neurologists today in the country are only about 1100 registered. There are lots of CPs who actually go and practice neuro practices. But there are very few of them. Right? So I personally think that there is a lot less happening in the services space, but a lot more happening in the product space. So if you, for example, go and look at how many drugs are coming in schizophrenia or epilepsy or uh, some of the other neuro disorders, there's a lot happening there. I think this is a space where a lot of research is actually happening by the top 30 pharmacos in the EU top 5 plus US countries. The services model is actually lagging way behind. That would be my, does that answer your question? The recent talk, um, I heard that if you see the lifestyle disorders, uh, the top three are uh, cardiac diabetes, and then the third one is stress. And uh, if anyone of us looks around, uh, most of the people with mental health uh, problems are actually scared to go to a psychiatrist. And like I said, neurology is very uh, expensive and uncommon. So uh, I think all the people going to the yogis and all the <laughs> so-called uh, stress healers, they are actually making all the money out of this sector. Uh, so I wonder if uh, there's a way out, because there's no insurance either right, for mental health. At a stage in terms of services, wherein it's a big taboo to actually just go ahead and you know talk about the fact that you have a neural or a, or a psychiatric disorder. I think that taboo is something that completely dominates this market because typically what happens is because of that taboo, uh, you know you would have read it in the papers that people people just don't go out. I think we are at that stage wherein wherein that uh, thing is not even accepted by the family. So though it affects us a lot, I think we are still at uh, our infancy and hence I think the amount of work that has been done by either the private or the corporate sector is very, very uh, limited. If I may add the factor in our society, uh, it also applies uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, the statistics that the Indian government puts out are roughly half what the World Health Organization puts out. And mental health is a form of disability in my opinion. Average families do not want to admit that there is, they have a person with a disability in their home. So, uh, I think until we are more open as society uh, in that respect, the, the service providers are not going to come out and offer the services uh, until that gets fixed. How long that will take? I don't know. So. Next question, please. Uh, my question is on two aspects. Uh, one is, uh, one, can you throw some light on uh, personalized healthcare uh, to the patients? Uh, because today we are most of, most of us are, are very knowledgeable, you know. And the second thing is, what are the trends of nanomedicine? The trends of nanomedicine in the healthcare sector. I'm in a position to do that. No, I think uh, this uh, this idea of personalization is actually very important. I think it's one of the, one of the, one of the things that will really shape healthcare of the next uh, next decade and a half. Uh, and I think um, I think for for us to give truly personalized medicine. Uh, I think we need to understand much more about the patient. Uh, that's partly comes from the patient disclosing more about themselves. Uh, that also comes with capturing that information, using it properly, and making sure that we're systematically following up with that patient. So I think that's one key aspect of personalized medicine. Um, second is we need practitioners who want to think about patients in a personal way. Right? I think unfortunately, uh, just speaking from experience, most of our doctors are in more of a volume or high traffic game. So if you go to a normal doctor, you're used to waiting an hour, hour and a half in the, in the consulting room, waiting at him, and then get, barely getting you know, a few minutes with the doctor. And I think one of the things which uh, I talked about is, is so true, because the, to, to actually be personal as a doctor, I think needs to, to take the time to spend it with, him, with the patient. Uh, and so I think that's actually one of the key trends that needs to emerge, uh, but it's yet to happen uh, so far in the business. So, uh, uh, personalized medicine where customization to the individual, right? That's the probably the third layer. But the next layer, second layer that we need to look at is customization towards a group of individuals. For example, what Kaushik is doing at LifeSpring in terms of, uh, I think, diabetes management is one of the things that you mentioned, Kaushik. Wherein to a group of uh, individuals who are facing the same disease, how do we take care of diabetes management as a group, how do we take care of hypertension management as a group, 
That second layer, there's a lot of opportunity. Going forward to the third layer, which is customization to an individual, India is not that rich a country yet. Uh, of course, maybe late after a decade or so, we can get to that. But there are some interesting experiments happening. One of my friends runs this company called Map My Genome, wherein looking at the genomic analysis, you try to figure out what are your health factors, risk factors, and try to address health issues proactively, right? That's the third layer which, which we are talking about, which is the uh, customization of health. But it is not yet mainstream. Maybe five years from now, it could be mainstream. But there are a lot of interesting experiments happening, and it could be a very good business opportunity as well. If I may add on to that, uh, even in the US where they have had um, better medical records perhaps than we had in, in India, uh, the interoperability between hospitals and institutions has not been achieved. That's the holy grail. So if you go to another hospital, even though all your medical records may be available at your home hospital, uh, they are handicapped. So that is something that will uh, take a lot of time to develop. And perhaps in India, because we are at an infancy, we could leapfrog that stage if we plan it properly and make it inter interchangeable or interoperable. Uh, That's something that we need to uh, think about. I have the next question. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm Smita. And my question is, what is the scope for respiratory healthcare, for respiratory diseases in India? Is that what I have gathered information? Uh, even respiratory diseases is a very high uh, number in India, along with cardiac. So we just wanted to understand what is the scope for this particular segment. Yeah, see, see I just outlined how this uh, respiratory disease care scenario today in the country, right? Uh, okay. I mean, if you look at every seats, I think you can count on your just few fingers, right? In terms of general disorders, there are two which actually plague our population. So there is COPD, which is uh, a chronic disorder, very similar to asthma, which is actually acute. So COPD and asthma are basically the ones wherein a lot of our population actually has both incidence as well as prevalence, meaning a lot of us suffer from it. I think the real opportunity here lies in products. Because this is very, very simple general medicine, which is actually practiced by uh, consulting physicians and general practitioners. So for somebody to make a, uh, make a business out of just services purely is going to be difficult because it's an extremely fragmented market. But I think a lot of innovation can happen here in products. So I'll give you a few examples. Actually, respiratory devices, the COPD asthma, uh, the typical way in which the uh, drug delivery is done is through inhalers. So you actually pump them in. So I think a lot of innovation is happening in the country wherein people are trying to reduce the nasal deposition that stays after the inhaler. So for example, if you spray the inhaler in the nose, what happens is some of the drug always stays back and does not get into the system. So to reduce that, a lot of innovation is happening both in the design of the inhaler, you know, in the, like you asked, nanomedicine. A lot of them actually becoming micro granular so that they can actually enter the system. A lot of that innovation is happening and you can create a business out of it. But on the services side, I have my doubts. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Hi, good afternoon, Amit. And Asish, uh, I definitely like you to comment on this and any of the others. As uh, entrepreneurs build out businesses, what's the guidance on how much money they should spend on marketing? Zero revenue. <laughs> At its stage wherein, uh, you know, fundamentally we have a lot of demand supply gap. So you could actually say that a lot of marketing is not really required because there is demand supply gap. So you have to just find out and make people aware and accessible and as they said, affordable, right? I think if you're solving the problem at its grassroots, which is the three years that uh, Vikram alluded to earlier, if you make people aware of what you have, if you make it accessible and you make it affordable, the real need for marketing fundamentally should be lower. Having said that, within marketing, if you really ask me, healthcare is at a stage where people, if they are spending above the line, meaning in boardings, in televisions, in newspapers, I think fundamentally that is something that we shouldn't do because that actually completely destroys the economics. More below the line to solve these three A's is what I would uh, ask the entrepreneurs to focus on or look for those entrepreneurs who actually focus on below the line for these three A's. 
uh, question, you know, where the industry trends, I think uh, for, for tertiary healthcare uh, services, typically between 5 to 6 percent above that is, is generally a red flag for us. Plan to utilize uh, PR as a big tool, right? Uh, as Ashish mentioned, uh, here, the, the, if you hire a good PR agency, maybe 80,000, 1 lakh per month, the kind of leverage that you get out of uh, articles written about your company go a long way to build your brand and credibility versus if you even if you invest 2-3 lakhs per month in advertisements when the large tertiary care providers advertising is totally cluttered if you really want to make an impact you have to invest huge amounts of money right rather than making inefficient investments in advertising invest in the cheapest form of marketing which is PR right so highly recommend it has worked very well for Netflix Plus so far. I would highly encourage the other healthcare uh, entrepreneurs also to look at this very carefully. Any Currently, I think the challenge in any healthcare business uh, is, like you said, the demand is huge, right? the demand is out there. Uh, I think the, the number one thing an entrepreneur can spend time and money on is getting the supply side figured out, is getting the business model right. Because if you get it right, people will come. I take time. Uh, it does take time to create awareness and get it tried uh, in more so in healthcare than other uh, other sectors. Uh, but if you get that supply side figure out, get a model that's working, then people will come to you without you having to do much marketing. So I think that's really the thing to focus on from an entrepreneur perspective. But it's a it's a it's a business where you know how much you try to create that awareness. It's a service that's only required in an emergency. You know, so getting that recall is not as easy as it sounds on the surface. Uh, and therefore you are forced to rely on the first port of call that a patient or a consumer would go to and that's the dental practice. You know, so that really complicates the, the amount. The other point I would make is that uh, public relations has now become paid relations with most publications. So, Again, not as uh, cheap as it sounds. Uh, hi, Robert. My question is like clinics. So, these doctors are MBBS or uh, BMS, DUMS also. That is one part. Second is like if you see these doctors themselves are very uh, entrepreneurial. Yes. But many times they stay at work for uh, this hospital or trust the hospital for three years, two years, and then they start their own practice. Once they have their own clientele, so how do you manage this? Um, in our minds, it comes down to really, uh, I think if we took a step back when we first started thinking to this business, we said really, we have two um, core constituents, right? One is consumers, so of course that's the principal thing we focused on, which is to say, what does a consumer need that they're not getting today, right? So we, we really thought through that aspect of it. But we said the other key uh, constituent for us is the doctors that we hire. So what is the value proposition you create for these doctors, which actually makes it scalable, right? Because if you don't put as much thought into that, then you have a business that fundamentally can't scale because you can get maybe two, three, four highly motivated doctors. But, but when you're when you're talking about getting you know four hundred doctors, which is which sort of is what we're thinking about doing over the next few years, you really need to think through a value proposition that works. So that's that's one uh, one aspect of it. We put a lot of thought into it. I think that's something that we've tested and we've refined over the last year. And we've been quite proud about it. Uh, we've got very good. I mean, we've got almost hundred percent uh, retention rates by doctors. Uh, we get good doctors. Uh, to your point about the source of doctors, we don't hire anyone who's not allopathically trained. Uh, we actually don't even hire any fresh MBBS. So at the minimum, we need to have a, at least a three-year diploma post MBBS and. Our typical doctor is about uh, 30 years of experience on average uh, post their latest degree, about 40% of our doctors are MPs. Um, but, but no matter how much thought I put into creating a great value proposition, um, I also need to put uh, as much thought into what happens if this doctor does leave. Right? And so that's, uh, that's something that you need to be prepared for, you need to, you need to really put a lot of thought into. And, uh, and we think that uh, our doctors will inevitably leave after a few years, right? I, I think it's uh, expecting a doctor to stay more than five or six years or ten years uh, in a system is really very uh, unrealistic. But the goal is to create enough connects with the patient coming in 
that the patient starts believing in the institution rather than just the doctor. I think it's already starting to happen. Some of our, the couple of our most popular doctors ended up going abroad for further studies, uh, and actually one of them moved to another city. But we were able to transition pretty seamlessly because they're working in a group practice. Uh, the patient gets comfortable with not just the doctor, but the, but the atmosphere, the front office, the nurses, the uh, pharmacist, and it will be multiple touch points for the patient. But at least when that doctor leaves, that patient doesn't leave with them. So that's, that's something that we've, uh, we've tried to do. Great. Uh, I think the time is up. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Myself, Dr. Naveen Namani, the doctor so you. How do you explain the insecurity in the doctor fraternity that you invariably find that, uh, very few doctors grouping together to join hands to create a more quality controlled atmosphere for providing healthcare than independent practices that sprout up like mushrooms all over the city? So, I mean, any insight into that since you're the entrepreneurs dealing with doctors day in and day out? There are specialists, right? I think that is what I said. But if you take a look at the, the primary care level, which is the level that I understand, um, you know, the model of group practices, right? Uh, I think we in India are one of the last countries where you have individual practitioners. In almost every country globally, not just US and UK, where of course it's the 100% it's the norm, but even all of the Asian countries, etc., doctors come together for group practices because they feel they can share resources, they can. Um, uh, they can get more leverage from the assets that they have. Uh, and the other, uh, and, and so that, that's only the prevalent model. So the question is, why is this not happening in India? Um, if you take a look at why this happened in those other countries, why it first started coming up, there was really some kind of external pressure which, which was created. So uh, whether it be the government or insurers, uh, essentially coming in and saying, you need to organize yourself, so you need to upgrade your facilities, or you need to put in better standards. Individual doctors found it was too complex for them to do it. Uh, by themselves, and they thought they found it was easier to come together as a group to do it. That still hasn't happened in India, so that's one of the reasons why that lack of trust has really not been able to translate into doctors coming together to form something. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, if I may add to that, particularly, uh, quality of life is very important to people, no less for doctors. So, a doctor does not see any reason why he should work more than eight or nine hours a day. Uh, like all his fellow citizens. But in India, as I said in my opening remarks, the doctor was working 16, 18 hours a day. That is a, a factor. And in many countries, the government would not even, uh, you know, the regulatory authorities would not want that. Just as you wouldn't want your pilot to work uh, 18 hours a day, why would you want a, a cardiac surgeon to work 18 hours a day? It is a risk to his patients as well. So that certainly is a factor. The other one is very much one of trust. I have come across uh, a, a hospital in a small town that a group of doctors got together and, and started. Uh, they put in a lot of money into building it. Intentions were good, but once it was built, none of them wanted to give up his private practice and move full time into this uh, hospital they developed jointly. Because each thought he would be giving away more than he would give. And that's the sort of a mentality that is prevalent. I don't know why. I, 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 I don't believe really I can answer that part of the question. Great, thanks, sir. So, uh, just uh, compared to what has been happening in the last 10 to 15 years in terms of more and more multi-specialty hospitals, healthcare is looking at a change uh, in India, especially in healthcare delivery. The experiments, of course, there will be many experiments, many will, uh, I mean, many will fail, but few of them will definitely succeed. The third thing is, uh, India is on a sort of growth path, wherein the awareness, the affordability, the, these factors will definitely help any healthcare venture which has the basic model figured out. So the the future is very bright for healthcare delivery. I just want to close on a uh, on a small incident. Uh, I visited Jaipur about two years back and visited the head of nephrology uh, at this government hospital. And I said, Dr. Saab, we have to look at how to make sure that government is paying for dialysis. I see a lot of patients dying uh, because of lack of access and lack of money for dialysis. The head of nephrology, he, he was shocked. His face was so shocked. He said, Vikram, are you out of your mind? There are basic clean drinking water, malnutrition, uh, the birth, mortality. These are fundamental issues we need to focus on. Why are you talking about dialysis? Hardly if you look at it, it's like 1 lakh patients every year. Why the hell should the government spend money on such a small impact population? So, 
this is just to give you a sense that India is way behind on the healthcare scale. But the future is bright. Next decade, decade and a half, there are a lot of experiments that will run, and hopefully, many of them will succeed. Thank you, guys. We'll hang around here for any further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vikram.